Okay, so let's start. It's three o'clock. Unmute, unmute yourself, please. Okay, hi guys, it's 3 p.m. and I want to say very, very big welcome to everyone who is on at the moment. It's amazing, amazing, amazing to have you guys. Thank you very much to our um, consistent um, attendees who came in the first week, second week, and now in the third week. You're very much welcome also. Um, yeah, I mean, IK and I, we, you know, welcome you on our platform. It's set to be an amazing time, uh, amazing hour. That's, of course, because time is money. This is well invested, I promise you. So welcome once again. And um, I'm going to hand over to IK to just give us the quick house rules. And um, yeah, we'll take it from there. Yeah. So hello, everyone. Happy new month. Someone says happy new yeah, month. Happy new me. month. <laughs> <laughs> so happy new month. Thank you guys for joining us again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So quickly, before we head into today's um, broadcast, let me go over some quick rules. Okay, so we're all to stay mute, please, so that we have a seamless and, you know, happy session. Thank you. Happy Workers' Day. Yeah, yes. today is all about workers. Yay. <laughs> okay, so please use the chat to send comments and thoughts. And of course, use the Q&A section to send in questions. We are also broadcasting live into Facebook right now. Sadly, we are struggling to get on YouTube, sadly. But we'll sort that out before the next session. I mean, before the next edition. So please, if you ever get thrown out and you're not able to come back into the broadcast, please just head straight to Facebook on our page, Health and Safety Knowledge Sharing Series. You'll find it on Facebook quick and easy. We are live and direct there. Okay, so quickly, in the personal section, I mean, in the personal, in the personal chats, please do not share personal details. And it's really just to make sure that your details don't get into the wrong hands and really just information security. If you've got any questions, or anything you want to ask or share with me and for me, then you can send us, you know, an email or yes, yeah, just reply to any of our emails. I'm sure you've been getting our emails. Okay. And of course, this is a safe space. We want people to feel comfortable. We want people to feel happy. So please zero spam, zero spam. So that is it. Please share comments. Please share your thoughts. We want it to be very, very interactive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome once again. So I'll hand over to Fumi. Thank you very much, IK. Um, I'm seeing so much comments already coming in um, in the in the chat box already. Thank you. I, there's only one person who calls me FA. So for my fellows in the banking world, thank you. I recognize you guys. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen. Um, where is it? I'm going to share my screen. Host is disabled. Da, 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 da. Um, let's see. I'm going to just quickly share my screen uh two seconds uh, i'm just trying to share my screen very quickly but whilst we wait we want to say a big happy happy workers day to everyone who's joining us everyone who's a worker and you know prospectus worker as well we we celebrate you um i'm just going to share my screen now okay here we are i'm sure you can see my screen can you see my screen guys yes we can right amazing 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 i'm just waiting for it to load of course um as you have seen our flyer it's all about building the workforce it's all about em empowering the workforce and of course achieving um a more safety aware workforce through capacity building um i'm sure some of you have seen our flyers going out uh, going around the publicity and everything on our giveaway as well so you need to stay tuned you need to stay right through to the end because we will be calling out some names um and you just want to be that lucky winner i promise you so my topic is really on capacity building. Um, knowledge is profitable. Okay. I, I also want to use this opportunity to remind you guys that um, we will be sending out our slides as always. You know, many of you guys who've been with us from week one, you would know that you get our slides on a, on a weekly basis. So uh, our presentation will come out to you at the end of our webinar. 
Right, so three points. Um, and the objective of my session today is importance of health and safety capacity building, uh, benefits of capacity building, obviously looking at the link of productivity and profitability when it comes to having a safety aware workforce. And lastly, HSE courses that is applicable to everyone, whether you are a professional or non-professional, uh, as we'll find out, health and safety is everybody's responsibility. So knowledge is indeed profitable. Okay. Um, statistics shows, and this is again, just in the UK, I'm sure, you know, I just want your mind to go wild on what other, other um, jurisdictions are, particularly those that are the developing sector, I mean, the developing countries, um, what they're like, or even countries without a very strong health and safety regulatory framework. Um, over in the UK, you have a very sound uh, health and safety framework. And even with that, the statistics are still very much alarming. Over 200 people are killed each year in accidents, you know, and over 1 million people are injured. Over 2 million people suffer illnesses, either that is caused in the workplace or is actually aggravated whilst at work. Okay, so why this topic is so apt is that providing health and safety information and training will help your organization, help you as a person as well, to ensure that employees are not injured, which is you, um, or made ill in the workplace um, organizations. As we go back, um, obviously a lot of jurisdictions are lifting their lockdown protocols at the moment. So we need to go in with a different mindset and not business as usual. And so as we do that, we need to ensure that there's a good, positive, sustainable health and safety culture. Um, where it just, you know, safety becomes a uh, second nature for everybody in the organization. But that's not going to happen in just a click of a finger or overnight. It comes with building capacity, it comes with training, it comes with sensitization. And of course, primarily, it helps you meet your legal um, responsibility as well. In health and safety, we normally say there are three core fundamentals to ensuring health and safety in the workplace. Um, one is the moral, you know. Why? Because it costs society upwards of 14 billion every year to help people recover from workplace accidents. That's a huge number. And so you can imagine if that number is in the reverse, used to empower, to educate, sensitize workforce. I mean, that would not be, you know, it wouldn't be the amount that we should be paying out. It'd be an amount that we use as an investment, as it were. And also, Every employee has a right and expectation that they're not to leave their house able, able body and, you know, go back home um, in any form of uh, disability, whether losing an arm, a limb or what, whatever it is. So, you know, from a moral perspective, every employer should have, and even employee, when you are at work, it's also, there's a moral duty on you to ensure that your, your um, actions or inactions does not cause your fellow colleagues um, you know, or does not infringe the right and exp expectation of your fellow colleague whilst they're at work. The, the second arm to the fundamentals of why health and safety is important, particularly why capacity building plays a key role to it, is the legal perspective. You know, I've mentioned in the, in the previous slide that employer, there's a duty on an employer. And how? It's to provide a, a, a safe workplace, you know, to, for employees to, to protect themselves from others. Um, and to, to protect themselves and others, pardon me. And of course, you know, there may be some organizations that probably don't have the um, internal competent person to ensure that it is actually at this point that you need to consider looking at maybe consultants, um, contractors who would come in to help you to ensure that you meet that compliance. It's a legal requirement, you know, and of course, ignorance is not going to be an excuse in the court of law. The third arm to why it's so important is financial. You know, um, it, it just, you need to just be educated, you know, because it will cost your organization. It can cost a person as well if there's a civil dispute, but if, you know, if there's a, if there's a criminal um, uh, dispute or a criminal offense, you know, you're looking at insurance costs, your premium will increase, uh, loss of production or, you know, reduced outputs, your employees are, are not really, the, the morale's dropped, you know, there's sickness, um, sick pay that you have to look at, damages to maybe the property, materials, equipment, and what have you. And of course, the most important one is the reputational damage. It would impact the organization significantly, you know, spending money to rebuild an image. You know, it's not a very cheap one to do. So this is the reason why it's important that the workforce must be safety aware in order to help organizations to reduce their exposure 
to all the three things that we've mentioned. So I'm going to move on to benefits of capacity building and looking at it from the perspective of productivity and profitability. But before I do that, I think there should be a backdrop understanding to what is capacity building, because you've heard that in my topic, you've heard me say that, you know, in the past few slides. And I've just got a, a very small sentence here that gives what that is. You know, training means, it, capacity building means, you know, training, building up yourself, adding knowledge, adding value to yourself in one way or, an, or another, whether through uh, training or through experience on the field, which we're going to hear IK touch on during the course of her presentation, but mine's looking more at the angle of, um, you know, certification, training, like getting a proper, you know, competency badge, you know, just so that that way, when you go into the workforce, when you find yourself anywhere, there's that confidence because there's that credibility that you can demonstrate that you have the requisite skills and, and understanding. So training means helping people to learn how to do something, telling people what they should do, sometimes what they should not do, or simply just giving them information. And of course, it doesn't necessarily have to be very formal in a classroom setting, but you know, where people have to feel the need to get a certificate, but it is important. And there's two sides to it. My, uh, like I said, IQ will be touching on the, the flip side of um, adding value or building capacity. So when we're talking about pro productivity, profitability, what does that mean in health and safety? Okay, so in terms of productivity, improving health and safety will help the morale staff to be improved, to be increased. And of course, you get the best out of that staff. You get the best out of that employee. They deliver. They deliver, you know. And of course, if they deliver, it does show in your bottom line, which we'll touch on when it comes to profitability. Of course, um, in terms of productivity as well, employees can do their work in a less hazardous environment. And um, they appreciate you more. You know, they appreciate you more that, you know, you've created a good space for them to work for you know and protecting their physical well-being and their mental well-being as well and in the long run this can save the organization a lot of money and so how can we save the organization a lot of money and that's where profitability is because every organization is in to make money it's it's in it's in for business you know and there's no point in you report you're always being in the red um in an organization so how can we do that increase bottom line by how can you increase your bottom line pardon me is by ensuring what I've said, creating a, a, a very safe space for your staff, boosting their morale so that we ensure that there's no lost time or even indirect cost. Lost time in what sense? If there is an accident in the workplace, you've got to think about the time that, you know, both the person has been injured, is taken off their activity. Another person you've got to bring in to carry out investigation. Another person you've got to bring in to cover the time of that work, I mean, cover the work the person that's been injured was meant to be doing. So there's a whole lot of indirect costs affiliated to um, lack of compliance or lack of knowledge, health and safety knowledge. Um, again, reduce sicknesses and absences. Um, if we can reduce this, this can increase the bottom line. And again, by ensuring that there's a great space, employees understand uh, fundamentals of health and safety to help them look after themselves to ensure that, for instance, you know, when it comes to manual handling, they understand if you sensitize them on how to conduct manual handling, proper manual handling in the workplace, they can reduce the impact on their health. And that can, of course, um, you know, reduce the impact of absences and sicknesses in the workplace. I've talked about insurance premium already. You know, if you can ensure that you're, there's no um, claims, your premium can invariably be impacted because it'd be reduced premium, but whether you, where you have numerous claims because it is demonstrating you don't have um, a good health and safety management system in place. It will affect your, um, your premium, you're paying more, it affects your bottom line. Um, you know, litigations, compensations, medical expenses, fines, and even property losses. You know, so the list goes on. Um, but like I said, I will share this with you guys. So moving on to the more interesting part is what are the courses? How do we educate ourselves? Um, because generally speaking, a lot of people here, when they hear health and safety, oh, you know, we're going to just pass on to the health and safety manager to just get on with it. No, particularly for um, decision makers, executives, top management, um, you know, you need to understand that you can delegate responsibility, but never accountability. So it's important that you understand your fundamental, the fundamentals of health and safety um, in the workplace. So we're going to be looking at the different courses for professionals. Um, and that's our health and safety officers, those with primary responsibilities and the non-professionals. Okay, so 
Who are the professionals? I've said a professional is someone with anyone with primary responsibility to manage health and safety in the workplace uh, with the requisite professional qualification. Okay, so an example would be uh, a health and safety officer, a health and safety manager, a head of health and safety, a director of health and safety. So somebody with a primary responsibility to look after, to manage a health and safety system in an organization. And who's a non-professional? That, that's, to be honest, the opposite of uh, the category I've just mentioned. Anyone with a health and safety professional qualification, um, anyone without, pardon me, a health and safety qualification and or expertise. So an example would be the CEO, HR team, your admin team, procurement, legal, the list goes on. And these are like categories of people you, would, you wouldn't classify as um, professional. They fit in the non-professional category. But guess what? I've got good news, okay? You know, we're talking about building uh, a health and safety aware workforce, meaning that everybody, there must be a space for everybody. There must be a solution for everyone, for everyone to do their part. So we're going to talk about the professional first, okay? For those who are interested, I mean, existing professionals, aspiring professionals, what are the routes and courses that you can look at? Um, professional qualifications out there, particularly to start your professional career, um, you know, aside from doing all the other health and safety courses here and there, but in terms of professional qualification, you want to be looking at, you know, to start off with, with a level three national or international general certificate and then of course a level six which is a step higher or perhaps a, a degree um, with uh, health and safety discipline or of health and safety discipline and so how does that uh, tie in into membership you know i would promote one membership that not because i'm the consultant to them for west africa which is iosh but because i'm also a member and i i can see the added value um, of being a member of the institution. So some of you may, um, you know, want to join your local institute, but they, this, they are a professional institution. We'll talk a little bit about them a bit later. So with the level three, it admits you into technical membership. Um, so for employers, you want to know when you're hiring um, quote and unquote professionals, you know, and you're looking at their certification. Um, one of the other things that you can be looking at is what affiliation do they have with institutions? their own professional institute. And so it gives you an idea of what to look out for. So they're technical members and that's for like a general set, a level three holder. Then you have like the level six holder um, or a degree holder who would then look at being a graduate member of the IOSH Institute. And, you know, it's abbreviated as grad IOSH. And as you look at that, you know, if you look at the, the different categories I mentioned, the different hierarchy I mentioned earlier in the previous slides on HSC officer, um, manager, head of, director, as they begin to move through the career journey or through the hierarchy, um, this is what you begin to see. And these are the things that you can begin to ask of them. You know, chartered membership status is another one that, you know, um, the Institute offers. And this is, uh, you can't get there without being a graduate member. So on completion of your graduate membership or admission, you then go through some assessment to be admitted into the chartered membership. Then um, after five years of being a chartered member, you can then apply or be admitted into the fellow um, status of, of the Institute. So just a brief, a brief um, background or backdrop to who IOSH is. Um, IOSH is a chartered body and membership organization, the largest health and safety professional membership organization across the globe. So it's one that you want to be affiliated with. So you're not really um, tied by jurisdiction. So if you're in Nigeria, you're in UK, you're in, I mean, you're in America, Europe, Africa, Asia, wherever you are, IOSH, is, ha, IOSH has a presence in a lot of countries, over 75 countries. And so you can be rest assured that you will be recognized anywhere in the world where you have IOSH qualification or IOSH membership. Um, I've often had people ask questions, oh, what's the distinction between um, NIBOSH and all of these things? I hear NIBOSH, I hear IOSH, or, you know, there's so many questions that comes from that. NIBOSH, just like all the other ones I've listed here, NCRQ, City and Guild, there's still a few more. They are just awarding bodies. So they just do, you, all you can get from them is a certificate. But then you take that certificate back to IOSH to become a member of IOSH. So, of course, um, without doing any marketing, why not just do the IOSH course? directly and of course do everything uh, with IOSH. Um, IOSH as well, you know, it's not very, unlike some of the other, other bodies, 
it's not very academic based, it's very practical based and it ensures, IASH ensures that you're not stale, you know, it ensures that you keep, um, you know, keep updated once you're also remember, you know, with them, there's something that you've got to do CPD on a monthly basis, you've got to keep updated with your CPD to remain relevant and to maintain your, your status with them. Um, that's just a flowchart of um, the membership structure of IOSH. Again, you get this, um, you know, at the end of our conference. So, like I said, I've got good news, mm -hmm. good news for the non-professionals. So here we are. We have different non-professional courses with IOSH and, um, you know, it ranges from whether executive level right through to junior management level um, that cuts across all boards. So we have the IOSH leading safely and that cuts across to all executives, senior management level, um, where they know exactly what, the, you know, what their responsibility is. Because it's one thing to be accountable for something and you don't even understand what you're being accountable for. So it's, I will encourage executives, top management to really kind of pursue this and at least get the fundamentals of um, health and safety in order for them to ensure compliance um, and make sure that their health and safety manager isn't just whapping, you know, yapping away and giving them fibs because they don't know. IOSH Managing Safely is targeted at man a management level, so mid or junior management level, so long as you have a responsibility to look out or to supervise or to manage people, that would be ideal for you. Then we've got the IOSH Working Safely, which everyone within the organization should get this because in order for you to ensure a safety aware workforce, they need to understand the fundamentals of health and safety. Okay, maybe not the nitty gritty like the professionals would do, but the fundamentals to ensure the safety of yourself and your well-being, this is something that you may want to look at, um, you know, enrolling. I would strongly recommend um, you do so. Um, and we offer these courses, by the way. I better chip that in whilst we're there. Um, we've got some other um, courses such as the IOSH, uh, Safety and Health for Construction Managers, Safety and Health for Construction Workers as well. So in summary, as I come to the end of it, um, I think it's important to note Air health and safety is everybody's business. We have a duty of care as an employer to ensure safe space, safe workplace, safe environment for our workforce. And as an employee, there is a duty of care on you for yourself as well as your colleagues, you know, people that you've got to work with. Um, again, in order for us to achieve a better, um, a better working environment post COVID, uh, we need to change uh, the mindset of people, positive safety, health, uh, health and safety culture is what we need to encourage, is what we need to um, enhance in our organization moving forward. And to do so, we need to close the knowledge gap through training. There's no other way you're going to close that knowledge gap. It, the only way you can close that up is through trainings. And these are the trainings that we've mentioned, or I've mentioned rather in previous slides before that. And importantly for you to remember is productivity, profitability, they work hand in hand in order for an organization to, you know, to be in the in the black not in the red okay so we have a giveaway I, i've mentioned that and so we'll talk about that a little bit later but we do have a giveaway um for two lucky winners and those lucky winners will be announced during the course of this um session uh so i'm going to pass over to ik now i think we'll take questions i don't know if we've got questions ik do we have any questions so we'll take questions at this point but thank you very much guys for listening uh, and uh yeah i'm taking questions Oops. Okay, yes, so that was nice. Thank you for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think that's very relevant information because the truth is most people, when they try to get into safety, they actually start with the wrong course. And then when I see them doing that, I'm like, why are you doing that? They're like, oh, I want to get into safety. And I'm like, no, you should be doing that, you know? So it's very good that you've given us this information. People need to know what they should be doing rather than wasting money and wasting time on doing courses mm -hmm. that are not relevant and will add no value or no no professional, you know, experience for them. So thank you very, very much. So I've, ju I've got just one question here and it's, um, it says here, do you offer certified training in the UK where employees receive relevant certificates to demonstrate this training? Absolutely. So CTS, I happen to be the um, CEO MD of CTS and CTS is a health and safety um, organization in, in, involved in auditing certification and that's ISA certification, uh, professional uh, qualification. So we do quite a number of things. Um, we also consult for organizations. So yes, we do offer, to answer, to answer that question, we do offer various trainings, um, in-house courses and also um, external 
certifications yet. Okay, so thank you. So it, uh, there's another question here. Where can I attend IOS training in Lagos? Or where can I run IOS training in Lagos? I'm not sure what they mean, but I'm thinking this person wants to attend IOS training and I'm sure CTS does that training. Yep, yep. So we do, we do. So I hope that's answered the question. Um, okay. There's another, there's more questions popping in, interestingly. It dummy. Yes, and then, uh, yeah. So there's one here that says, um, I think they attended IOSH conference, they have the ESPON, they thank IOSH um, team, and then they want to know about the membership registration. What does it entail? Fantastic. Becoming a member of IOSH, what does it entail? Yes, so there are um, different means to be, uh, becoming uh, a member. Obviously, I've talked about the different categories of membership IOSH has got, but you can go on the IOSH website or just put on Google and just put IOSH membership, it takes you directly there. The good thing as well at the moment is IOSH has been so kind that it's um, offering concession fees um, for people who earn less than 10,000 pounds a year. So I think that's around between 4.55 million Naira um, in the Nigerian jurisdiction. So I don't know what that is in, in, in dollars or what it is, but just convert that. If you earn less than 10,000, pounds a year you can actually apply for a concession rate which gives you 50 percent off your membership there's another question from there's another question he says here that the entry level is hse level one to three where does this stand in nigeria that the local training in nigeria is hse level one to three where does that stand Okay, so each jurisdiction will have its own requirement, to be honest, or what's popular in the market. What I can say uh, as the consultant for IOSH as well in, in West Africa is that we are working very closely with Nigeria, with um, the CIPM, particularly who are obviously responsible for people management, the HR, um, represent, HR personnel in, in Nigeria. So we are responsible, we're working, well, IOSH is working collaboratively with CIPM to make sure that, you know, some of these IOSH courses that I've listed is part of the uh, prerequisite. But it's a good thing to have. If you have level one, two, three, there's nothing wrong with it. These are fundamentals into getting into um, health and safety. The only thing is, will that one, two, three be recognized outside of your jurisdiction? So what you want to do is to look at qualifications that doesn't limit you or box you up within your jurisdiction and would be recognized outside of your jurisdiction anywhere in the world. And so hence the reason why, you know, IOSH is number one that I'm promoting, um, you know, for people to, to enroll on. Okay, so one last before? question before I go in. Do you, did you want to say something? We have one from Jennifer in the Q&A. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah, so I was going to say, we've answered Jennifer's. We've answered okay. Jennifer's. There's one here that says, how is the health and safety knowledge relevant to education? How is it relevant to education, health and safety knowledge? How is it relevant to education? That question is quite broad, isn't it? Um, yes, it is. So in, I would want to think in what context, just generally speaking, having health and safety knowledge is something that's transferable. It goes beyond the workplace, actually. It's something that can be used in your home. I find myself risk assessing in my home. I can sit down and I'm looking at the dining table. There's a cup on the dining table and I'm telling my son, move that cup, just move it because I can, I've already done a mental risk assessment um, that you know what there's a likelihood that there might be an accident that can occur or an incident that can occur from that cop being at the angle where it's at so it's important to education because it's a transferable skills that you can apply anywhere in any discipline in any sector in any way you find yourself okay so i think that's the last one we will take for now and then they talk about oh, a lot of people another question. I have another question um, sorry from uh, okay Shelly let Lincoln. me yes do you have a special training? We have one from Mr. Shagun Adenuga. Do you have specialized yes. training for charity organizations, especially for places of worship? That is an amazing um, question. And of course, we are happy to provide that because a place of worship is a place of work, firstly, for the, the people who work for the church office to start off with. So of course, we can um, provide something for them but also particularly because it's a public space. So we need to ensure that, um, you know, leadership within the church are knowledgeable or have the prerequisite knowledge to be able to help and administer any form of support when it comes to health and safety. You can have a, a member of um, the congregation who suddenly collapses, you know, um, we need to have understand fire drills, for instance. If there's an, is a fire drill, how do you evacuate the building? How do you evacuate in the event of maybe a bomb threat 
or what have you. So yes, to answer the question, we do have specialized training that can be tailored to the target audience. There's another one. Oh my goodness. There right. are many, there are actually a few more. Yeah. And then, um, okay, let me read this one. I think someone is asking something about the place of regulatory bodies for those that go to NYSE camps. I won't call it repeat off, but he says um, certification bodies are flooding NYSE camps to rip off the COP members. What's the place of regulating bodies in this? Right. I really um, don't know. But I would probably say first, in terms of regulating, it would be the place of NYSC to regulate what and who comes on the camp to start off with. So they have to do their due diligence um, to start yeah. off with, to make sure that um, the people that are coming on are of, uh, they're not quacks to start off with, they're recognized bodies and they just do their due diligence on the organization. I, I can actually say the CTS in the last, uh, just before the lockdown, we were actually stationed in, at the camp and because we wanted to give back to the community, we wanted to give back to young people who were just about to start finding their bearings and possibly have interest in becoming health and safety professionals, how can we meet their needs? So, um, I mean, we were one of the people who went to the camp and, you know, um, you may find some that are illegitimate and it's in the place of the management of the NYC to, to sieve out those who are quacks and, and, and legitimate. Okay, so I think that's all we will take for now. Yes, for now. <laughs> because and time, it's, yeah. it's fair to note, it's, it's fair to note as well that any questions that hasn't been answered, we would put, find a way to incorporate it into an FQA yeah. and then so we'll answer all your questions, albeit because we yeah. like to stick to time on here. Um, and Ike needs to go on. So I'm going to um, see how I can bring, Ike, you are going to be going on um, shortly. So you need to share your screen with us. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I hope our participants who have liked our pages, who have followed the instructions <laughs> to win the prize are on here. So Ike, over to you. Okay, so thank you. So thank you guys and thank you for me again. Okay, so quickly, very quickly, because we need to save time for the giveaway and the, you know, the, the fun parts. Okay, so I'm going to be looking at how you can gain experience and skills when you don't have money, you know, to pay for all these fancy courses that Fumi has mentioned today. Okay, so today we'll be looking at the major challenges that people face when they're trying to upskill and then we're going to look at four ways that you can beat these challenges, upskill, and of course, improve your safety knowledge. So it's really about us really getting very practical here. And then, of course, we'll have the, give the giveaway where we are giving away two courses at the end. So, yeah. So challenges to upskilling. I know now you've listened to Fumi, and she's mentioned all these courses that we need to attend. I am living safely, managing safely, the Nibosh, and all that. And I know you are thinking, but I don't have the money. I can't afford to go on this course. What do I do? So that is where I come in. Okay. So, um, but first I'm going to mention five reasons why people really cannot, um, cannot upskill or maybe they can't afford. Yeah. So the first one is there's really usually no support from the organization. So your organization or your employers, they really don't support your, your desire to grow, your desire for more training. And the truth is sometimes it could be for any reason. It could be that they don't have the money. It could be that you probably have not been performing well or well enough for them to think that it warrants that spending. And that brings us to the learning and development department. They cannot justify why they have to invest so much money in you. For example, I don't know if Fumi can help us, but um, I don't know how much the maybe managing safely, for example, you were a supervisor and you needed to do the managing safely. Fumi, like how much would that cost? Um, well, for Nigeria, for managing safely, you're looking just around 40, 35, between 35 to 40K. Um, okay. And in the UK, it goes for a different price in the UK. But please do send people to our website for them to go. Yes. To <laughs> okay, so imagine that and your L&D saying, why should I spend 40K on all these people? By the time I spend 40K on five different people, that's 200K. Do we have the budget for that? So they cannot really justify spend investing in you. And the truth is most of the time they go back to your performance. You know, they go back to your performance. They go back to your KPIs. Have you been meeting them? How have you been performing at work? Do we really don't want to spend money on someone? And then of course, if you've not been showing commitment and dedication and they see you as someone that can just up and leave at any time, then they will worry. They will be worried about spending so much money, you know? So apart from just the organization and the L&D, the truth is that most of us can afford to go on training ourselves. 
And that's where affordability comes in. Sometimes you just don't have that money. I, I think I will be very, very realistic here and say that I know that a lot of people don't earn enough to actually now say they want to cop out maybe about 40 or maybe 100K. Because the truth is, if you want to go to the Nibosh, I know the Nibosh is about 250,000, I think the certificate. So it depends on affordability, you know. So if you don't have that money, then you probably cannot, you know, go forward and do what you need to do. But the truth is, it's, the truth is you can upskill and you can gain skills even without spending so much money, okay? And then sometimes you don't have the time if a course is like four days, five days long, even a whole day, sometimes you don't have that time and it comes back to support from the organization. What if you're, what if the organization doesn't support you taking a day off to go and do the training? Because the truth is we have organizations like that that would never give you a day off to go and do trainings, you know, to attend training. So sometimes the time is just not there. And then sometimes you have distance. Maybe the course you want to attend is too far away from you. So you're thinking of transport, you're thinking of accommodation. I'll give you a very perfect example. The health and safety executive in the UK, they have them um, some training courses that they actually, that they actually, you know, so, uh, provide. And many of these courses are outside London. So sometimes you have to go all the way to Boston, Manchester. And then by the time you think of the journey, going to Manchester, going, return trip, you're probably spending about hundred pounds. By the time you go there, you pay for your accommodation maybe for two days, you pay for your feeding. So it becomes expensive. So it brings up back to affordability. This place is too far. And even if I could afford, I'm thinking, do I want to spend extra money on transport, feeding, accommodation, and things like that? So these are just five top reasons. But the truth is, you could have any reason why you could not upskill. There are so many reasons, but these are just the top five that I decided to share with us today. You know, and the truth is, I know this is this looks a bit sarcastic, like you can't afford training, so what? You know, but that is really me just saying that you can actually beat those challenges. Even if you cannot afford training, you can beat those challenges and you can actually improve on your safety knowledge and actually become very, very skilled. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my own story of how I started and where I am today so that you will know that it's very, very possible. Okay? So the first one, the first point I'm going to share with you is that you can take free courses online. I know you know that and I know that you've been taking so many. I see them on LinkedIn. I see them on Facebook, I see their certificates, and I'm like, oh, okay, wow, wow, this person is, you know. But the truth is not everybody has that, um, that idea to go online. And even when they do, sometimes they just do any course because it looks good. You know, so for example, we have um, COVID-19, and people have been taking a lot of COVID-19 courses. But in my mind, I'm thinking, is that really relevant to your professional development or your professional growth? If you're not going to look at going into public se sector, if you're not a health and safety person or if you don't have some leadership roles at work where you are required to you know, provide those then there's a limit to the kind of training the kind of COVID-19 training you should be going for but I've seen people go for all sorts you know and then with online training it has to be targeted it has to be relevant to what you want to do don't just do a course because you say it looks good or other people are doing it does it add value to you does it add to your knowledge does it add to the skills that you want to acquire because you want to be a safety professional so you have to make sure that it's targeted, you know, to your profession and it's relevant. And once something I've written here is I've said certificates do not really matter. And I've written except because they do matter, but they do not really matter, you know, <laughs> because I'm, why, why I'm saying this is that I think a lot of people are so crazy about certificates. And the truth is many employers, they would choose, they would rather choose you have the skills. They would rather choose that you're able to do the job than you have a, a fancy certificate. And I'll use, I'll use myself as an example for when I am recruiting, I'm an, I'm, I am an employer. And when I'm recruiting, I don't care about how many certificates this person has. You know, I've had a lot of people come to interviews for me and they, I'm, I'm sure if any of them is here, they can tell you that. I don't care about your certificate. Can you do this job? I want to see that you're able to do it. I want to know what skills you have. So when you come for an interview and I'm asking you, for example, oh, how will you conduct a risk assessment or have you ever conducted a risk assessment? And you're telling me, oh yes, I can. Oh yes, I know how to. You've not told me anything. You've not proved anything to me. What I want you to prove to me is that you can actually do this job. So I want you to, what I would expect is that you will give me an example and you would say, for example, maybe you want to risk assess, maybe, maybe a certain task that was going to be done in the laboratory or something. I would expect that you would go into details and explain to me the steps of this risk assessment and why you got, to, you know, what each of those steps represent, the end result and all the little, little things that go with it. So I would expect you to give me a proper breakdown. And when you do that in an interview, I'll be like, wow, okay, this person can actually do it. Even if they are not perfect at it, they can do it and they will get better. But if you just tell me, yes, I have done it, it's not good enough for me. So your certificate is not good enough for me. I want to know that you can do it. But then the truth is, as you're growing and as you're growing in your profession, 
you really need certificates. You really need to do proper, nice trainings. And the truth is, as you're growing, affordability will no longer be an issue. If you are, if you are performing at work, support from organization or from your learning and, and development team, it will no longer be that much of an issue. They will push and they will support you to go to grow in your profession. But you have to make sure that you are giving them something. Okay? So, and of course, you may ask here, and why I've said that is because you will ask, wouldn't they want to see my certificates? And I will tell you that at least my last two, three jobs, nobody asked for my certificate. Before interview or during interview, nobody asked me, where's your certificate? They wanted to know that I could do this job. They looked at my CV and they saw that maybe, oh, this person was good to do this job. And they wanted to see that I could do the job. They didn't ask for my certificate. And these are top companies. These are really, really top companies. So that is where this comes from. That they might not want to see your certificate, but for your own good, for your own growth, and just, you know, for even to make sure that you, you are credible because credibility comes in there. I'll give you an example. Now at work, I'm trying to um, renew one of our accreditations and they've asked there, who is the person in charge of health and safety? That's me, so I put my name in there. Why is this person in charge? What does this person have? Who is this person? What experience do they have? And I've put in my certificate and I've put in the years I've done and I've put in what I'm doing at the company. That is me providing evidence that I'm competent and that I'm credible and I'm, I'm qualified. You know, so of course my certificate will come into play you know, in certain things like that. And if you have a legal matter, maybe, for example, someone was trying to sue your company. If you have a legal matter, sometimes they want to see, okay, this person you put in charge, let us see, are they really, really qualified to do what they, what they do? You know, and it could come in to help you. So I'm not saying discredit certificates totally, but I'm saying for now, for you to make that first step, certificates might not be necessary. And I will explain it a bit more. Okay, so two, number two is, you need to provide support to your safety department. The truth is, safety department, many of you here will probably be safety professionals. You can, I'm sure you can, you can attest to the fact that a lot of safety departments, they are underfunded. The budget is usually the lowest in the organization. And sometimes you are usually the only person doing safety. You know, and sometimes you need that additional support. I've had people come up to me in different in past jobs and they want to support and they want to do stuff. They want to help because they want to learn about safety. They see, oh, I like what you're doing. I want to learn. Can I help you? Is there anything I can do? You know for you and the truth is you need that help so find a way to get into your safety department if you're not in safety and you've been trying to get in there find a way to get in there and begin to provide support and help that will be useful to the department okay so you don't have any job no problem because people will be like oh but i don't have a job how am i going to go to a safety department well you can volunteer yeah and this is how i started i started off as a volunteer and i'll tell you my story and when you're volunteering you have to be very very selective what kind of um, roles do I want to go for? What kind of company do I want to work for? You know, you're not volunteering because you want to go and make tea and coffee or photocopy paper. So you need to make sure that you are clear on the roles. So of course, if you go to, if you approach an organization and they're trying to take you on as a volunteer, you need to be clear on what am I going to be doing for you? You know, you need to find out. So be very specific and of course be calculated. And I will tell you why. In my previous, when I first started in health and safety, the profession, that was in 2009. When I first started, I started as a volunteer. I was doing my master's then in health and safety, and I knew that I needed that experience because I had just finished biomedical science and I was not getting a job in biomedical science. I didn't have the experience to work in a laboratory and nobody could understand that I was a fresh graduate. You know, that's the profession many people have. They are fresh graduates, they're out of school, but employers don't understand that they actually need to gain that experience, but they'll be asking you for experience that you're like, where am I going to get this experience from, you know? So I knew that I needed that experience because of the experience I had after my first degree. And of course, I started volunteering for a company and I volunteered with them for 18 months, one day a week because I was also doing my master's then. And while I was volunteering, I got very, very hands-on. Then asbestos was a big deal then, as far back as 2009, asbestos was a big deal. It was becoming a problem. And of course, I was asked to do a research. So I researched it and it was very, very rampant in schools in the UK. So I had to, I, I chose schools. I chose to create a pack information pack on asbestos for schools. We printed it out, did some binding, everything, and we distributed it, and that was my work. That was me as a volunteer doing something really, really, something really, really, you know, powerful. And then, of course, I finished volunteering there 18 months, and one day I got a call, and they said, oh, we want you to come and work for us. There was no interview. There was no, where's your certificate? You know, nothing like that. And I started work the next week. And the thing is, they had sacked two people and I was replacing them. And they told me that all the time you were volunteering here, everything you did, you did more than these two people combined. You know, so when you go and volunteer, what do I say be calculated? You want to go in there and make serious impact. You want them to remember you. 
And now I'm not saying that if you volunteer, that you are guaranteed to get that work. But the truth is it adds to you. It adds to your experience. You've gained something. And even while I was volunteering there, I would tell the other safety officers, I'll be like, when you're going out, I want to go with you. So if they were going to a client site or something, I would go with them because I wanted to see what, what are they doing. Because I used to see risk assessment. Oh, it must be something really tough and difficult. So I wanted to see how they were doing it, how they did the inspections. So I used to go out with them. And that was me doing more than I was required to do. You know, so that is really me just encouraging and saying, you can volunteer and you can get that experience. And of course, over the years, that, that experience has helped me. I've done other things. I've started my own projects. I did a safety department in the UK. So I actually have, I've gotten to the peak of my career because I'm at director level now. And after that, I don't know what else I would, I would need, maybe CEO or something, but I'm at director level now. And it has taken me about 11 years. So you can actually do it if you push and push and push, okay? So some people will say, I don't want to work for free. If you see it like that, I'm telling you, you will never make impact in that workplace. So don't see it as you're going to work for free. See it as I'm going there to go and pick something. I'm going there to add value to myself. I'm going there to improve my knowledge. I'm going there to actually gain from these people. You know, they are taking my time. So I must gain from them also. So you need to make sure that you are learning and you are doing. Because the truth is a lot of what we know, we know by doing. We know by actually being hands-on, okay? And then, of course, the very, very final point is you can start a, a, a small project. You know, you can start a small project. When I moved to Nigeria about, was it in 2014? That's where I started safe schools from. My mom owns a school, and I was running the school, and I realized they don't do safety in Nigeria. And that's where I started from. So I started in-house, small with the children, having weekly, and having a weekly health and safety, health, health and safety weeks, having sessions with the children, and gradually it became... Let's go to other schools. And it has become a proper project now. And safe schools is known. At least in the education sector in Nigeria, safe schools is known as the person you go to for health and safety. And that was really me starting something that I thought was worthy of me starting. So you could actually start something like that and you could gain experience. And of course, I wouldn't have started safe schools if I wasn't managing my mom's school at that minute. I wouldn't have learned what the risks and what the problems were in schools if I wasn't involved in that. So one, one thing I always say is that every experience, every volunteering, everything, pick what you can from there and get you know, the best, okay? So of course, we're gonna take questions and comments. And of course, our email address is there. If you have any of them, send them to us. So thank you very much. And of course, the giveaway. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank I you. You did very, very well. Um, I don't know if your screen, if you could stop sharing. Yep, that's it. Yes. Thank you very much, IK. That was a fantastic session and we've had comments coming in. Um, exactly, Dare Akinfisile has said, volunteering cannot be overemphasized. Great presentation from IK, absolutely. Well done. Um, we've got a question here, let's see. Um, I mean, it's, there's been a discussion going on um, concerning that question in, in the box, actually. Um, the Dr. Miriam K. Adewale says, how do you prove to your organization that HSC is not a money expense department? Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if IK is still there. IK, are you still with oh, us? I am. Oh, great. I am. Oh, great. Okay, because I can't see you anymore. Oh. But um, I think yeah, my, vi my video went off. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, yeah. I mean... Um, that question, if you want to answer it, but, but, but there's been questions, there's been discussions going on um, in, res in response to that question. Ah, okay. Often they see um, health and safety as a cost center rather than a cost saving um, center, but an expense, you know. So how do we get uh, management? Good thing as well, like you rightly mentioned, you sit at director level. How do you, how, how can we um, preach the gospel to the other directors, especially the finance directors? You know, how do we do this? How do we convert them to see that it's not uh, an expense center, but a cost saving one? Okay. So one thing I did actually in my previous role, the role before this pre present one was one thing I did was I had health and safety management meetings every month. So every head of department would come to that meeting. Yeah. And of course I would take them through accident statistics. I would take them through sickness records. I'll take them through all our little projects that we're doing. You know, and of course, and I think for uh, even that alone, they were really, really surprised. They were like, oh my God, all this happens. Because the truth is, health and safety is usually just there. It's usually just on its own. And if you don't involve everybody, if you don't involve everybody, it will become, it will become unimportant. People don't see the importance. The truth is, a lot of management don't see the importance. In my company, we do, because you, you are dealing with so many lives and we, 
tend to have some certain kind of injuries and claims and stuff like that. So we do take it seriously, you know, but you do have those and it's really about involving them in those meetings, especially your meetings, because the truth is everybody is busy. They'll tell you, I've got my finance issues to deal with. Oh, I've got my IT issues to deal with. They really don't want to be dealing with health and safety directly, but you need to involve them. And one thing I used to do was also meet with every head differently. And I want to ask what's going on in your department, any injuries, anything you want to share, how are your staff feeling? So I used to meet with them and of course they could see the importance of health and safety that so it's not just me coming to do risk assessments and just ticking off boxes. It was really me wanting to care about them and their teams and showing that I really cared about what was happening in the apartment. You know, yeah. and so involving them, yes. And even with the health and safety management meetings, I always make sure that when I have meetings, I have action points. And sometimes I'm telling them, I need this from your department. I need that. And of course, I'm doing this back and forth with them. So they are very involved. My yeah. current role, they are so involved that I, I mostly do strategy. So I'm not involved in those little health and safety things yeah. anymore. You know, so I mostly do strategy because everybody, the different department, the different area managers, they are all very involved, you know? So Thank you. yeah, it's really much. Thank you so much. I think just an addendum to that really is, um, and IK has mentioned some of it, is having a health and safety committee where you have somebody from top level, from a you know, senior management level who's chairs yes. the health and safety. So when they go to board meetings, when they go to senior management meetings, you ha they have that sense of responsibility to defend health and safety because they are part of the safety committee. And like IK has said, it's not about going to management to talk about your feelings, we heard that last week from our HR guys. Don't come to management. Don't come to HR sharing your feelings, what you feel will be good for management to do. You need to go there with facts. Just like Ike has yeah. said, you go there with numbers, death, you know, injury, lost time, sicknesses, absences. You're presenting facts to them. And so, and they know that, I mean, legal as well. You're presenting the, the fines of lack of compliance, et cetera. So I think that should really convert them to answer, to answer that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take one more question before we go to the giveaway. One more question. Um, yeah. Olojo David said, sometimes how do, how do an OSH professional convince her top management in, in investing in his or her capacity building, uh, provided there is funding, provided there is funding for such? I think you mentioned that in your slides already. Yeah. But then I would just add that you really need to show, and I, even the, if, you, if you attended the first week or if you watched the video from the first week, I keep saying there that you need to show them that you are something special. You, you know, you need to prove to them that I can do this job, I can help you, I can help your finances. So it's not really about me coming to tick box and prevent accidents also, but at the end of the day, it all falls back on the finances and insurance claims and stuff. But I can actually help you make money. I can mm -hmm. help our team be productive, mm -hmm. you know, so things like that. Yeah. 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 You need to be, you need to show that you are a hot cake for them to, <laughs> and I'm telling you, they will spend money on you. <laughs> they will spend it money on like you. The slides of the productivity and profitability, if you can actually bring that into, move it from a theory to mm -hmm. something that is evidence-based, I think any yeah. management would definitely yes. um, invest in you. So I think it brings us really to, if we haven't answered any questions, um, please, we will definitely respond. You know, you've got our email address as well. I think it's fumi.ik. Um, uh, dot safety dot safety care says, yeah. So we'll share that as well. Um, and be rest assured that you will get our slides. Please check your spam. Check your spam. Um, sometimes, it, it, you know, for the first two ones, I think it may have gone in some people's spam boxes. So have a look at it. And um, if not, just send us an email and we're happy to reshare again. So IK, I'm going to shake. I've got some names here. Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry, so I, I have to slide all the way. Stop to sharing this. your slides so that people can actually see me. Can you see me, guys? Ah, okay. Yes. <laughs> I want them to see the video. There's some sort of fairness in this. Um, sorry, it's a bit um local. <laughs> I've got a little bowl. Oh, okay. But I need to open up YouTube. Yes. So we want to give out um one professional qualification and one non-professional. We've talked about um, you know building a safety aware workforce um, for everyone and that's whether you're a professional or not okay so today we'll be giving out IASH courses um, a non-professional one and I, I mean I, because I'm very much strategic at this level I gave out an incorrect quotation for the um, IASH managing safely I had our, our head of operation to message you and said Nope, it's not 40,000, it's 120,000. So, you see, yeah, 120,000. So, you can imagine your management wanting to spend that kind of money on you. It has to be justified, it has to be, you know, worthwhile. So, we will be giving out one managing safely and one um, working safely um, course to someone. So, are we ready? 
We are ready, yeah. Okay, so we've got number two, number two. Oh, okay, so that's God's man for real. I'm looking at it on YouTube. God's man on here, he needs to raise up his hand. Can you raise up your hand, God's man, if you're here? And God's can... man for real? Is God's that Yemi? I don't know. Okay, no, no that's God's no. <laughs> Um, Boxman, if you're here, if not, we're going to move on very quickly. Okay. Um, let me write that down so that we contact him. Yes. We have number four. Oh, wow. Okay. Number four. He's number four. Single digits. John yes. Flynn. No, no, no. Oluwa Tosin Kasali. Oluwa Tosin Kasali. We're feeling yes. generous, so we'll make it one more. <laughs> We're well, okay. more. We are trying to, we just started, obviously, guys, this is our third session. We're trying to get our YouTube page up and running. And so far we have, I think, 70 or 60 something. Um, so, ooh, so we have number 61. Number 61. Okay. That's um, Fumi Oladokun. Fumi Oladokun, fine. We have that there. So those three winners will be in touch with three winners. Um, but we're trying to get to 500. Oh, you know, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very, very optimistic. But please help us go to our, our YouTube page and just hit the sub subscribe button so that you get a notification when we start. But most importantly, like our videos, share as well if you can. From Ike and I, it's been amazing, you know, to share uh, our time and our knowledge with you guys. And we hope that you can actually leave here. We've got Mayo Mayo Kun or Dusoya who's raised up their hand. Unfortunately, I'm a, I'm a respecter of time. We are a respecter of time on here, and we really kind of want to close. We've got before two minutes. Bang on. So this is we've got two minutes. I know. So can, so, I, can I quickly ahead. read comments from Facebook? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So um, somebody has said here that in the absence of work now, you should go and volunteer. Mm. Yeah. And then another person here has said something about certificates that a lot of certificates are pointless. We need to make sure you can do the work. So mm. you can see that the comments from Facebook, people have been supportive of what we are saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You'd be surprised how many people show up to interviews with certificate and you question them, you probe them and they can't deliver. So it's a shame. Yeah. So please find a way to marry your um, certificate with experience, whether through volunteering or, or in, you know, just mentorship, whatever it is, find a way to, to you know, marry the two together because it's important. I am um, IK, do you have anything to say? We want to say very big thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for joining us again. So we hope to see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the participants and everyone who joined. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. And see you okay. next week. Bye-bye. Bye. I think we need to end the Facebook.